Hi everyone, happy to be presenting in today's Product School webinar. My name is Makram Mansour and I will be talking about managing an experimentation platform. A little bit about myself, I'm a product manager at LinkedIn. Would love to hear from you and to connect with you at LinkedIn. Here's my LinkedIn profile. I have a master's and PhD in electrical engineering from University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. I also attended the Stanford LEAD program at the Stanford Graduate School of Business. Uh, before LinkedIn, I was a product manager at Texas Instruments, uh, driving the online design tools program for TI. And then uh, before that, I was an IC designer at Intel, working in the Intel Server Chipsets Group. One of the important values I have is uh, I consider myself an out-of-the-box thinker who is not afraid of taking risks. And I actually get more committed when people tell me it cannot be done. And I strongly believe in the saying, where there's a will, there's a way. Today's agenda, I will start by giving an overview of experimentation at LinkedIn. And then I will discuss how I prioritize my backlog and discuss the prioritization framework I use. And then I will talk about the workflow, how, do we, how have we optimized our workflow. And then I will give some final note on how do you develop your vision and strategy. As you know, our vision at LinkedIn is to create economic opportunity for every member of the global workforce. It's our true north and what drives our business, products and all our decisions internally and externally. Creating opportunity for every member is why we all come to work every day. And our mission is how we operationalize our vision. And it is to connect the world's professionals to make them more productive and successful. Whether it's a profile created, a connection made, or an open job that got filled, all these actions contribute to building the LinkedIn economic graph. This is a digital mapping of the global economy across these six dimensions. The LinkedIn data on the economic graph is actually mind-blowing. We have 96 million profile actions per day, 30 billion feed updates per month, 180 million messages that are get sent every day, and just to list a few. And all of this is happening across as people are connecting with each other and talking over the platform. Uh, this complex growth engine is full of network effect, just like the butterfly effect, we have the network effect on social platforms. Uh, one thing we learned over the years is that even small localized changes can have massive impact. Uh, for example, an AI engineer who was working on the PYMK algorithm, people you may know, could have made some small changes and, uh, and this could have caused some unforeseen negative impact on sessions. So imagine now we have so many different teams who are making different changes, uh, customer facing, infrastructure facing, and all of these network effects could have, um, uh, you know, could lead to uh, different consequences. So for us to maintain and accelerate our growth, it requires a strong discipline around experimentation and data. Here's another example, uh, of course, you know, typical not only for LinkedIn, but for any online e-commerce website, for example. Uh, we have the ad banner on the top and the designer decided to reduce the ad banner by five pixels. And you can see here, here the click-through rate chart. And uh, as soon as uh, this change got deployed into production, we started seeing a small dip uh, going down in the click-through rate. So as you can see, small changes just from a cosmetic, if we don't do A-B testing, there is a big significant impact uh, that could uh, automatically get reflected here. So the moral here is that we test everything at LinkedIn, whether it's front-end, ranking algorithms, back-end infra, testing and experimentation, every team, every product team, infra teams, they're all running these A-B tests and experimentations. That's the only way for us to make sure that any change that we are introducing on the platform, we are introducing it in a controlled manner, that we are seeing gradually the impact of it. We are checking our true north metrics, signpost metrics, guardrail metrics, making sure that they are all safe, our members are safe. We are keeping uh, all of these important metrics checked as we are deploying them and introducing them to the outside world. And this has a huge activity on our ex experimentation platform. So we see more than 100 new tests being run every day and uh, 400 uh, uh, tests that are, uh, or features that are being ramped. 
and there's a lot of uh, data here you can see in terms of uh, the activities that we're seeing on, uh, on our platform. So for us to support LinkedIn's goal and requirement of testing everything, we built a state-of-the-art large-scale experimentation platform at LinkedIn. And it handles like uh, tracking, uh, data, events, uh, more than 90,000 queries per second. We have an offline infrastructure, petabytes of data that's being computed. Then we have we compute the, all of the unified metrics platform, 20,000 metrics that are being uh, computed every day. 8,000 8, of those are A-B testable metrics. And then we all of this is being fed into the experimentation platform, our charting platform, as well as our anomaly and alerting infrastructure. We call LinkedIn experimentation platform T-Rex. T-Rex stands for targeting, ramping, and experimentation. Targeting helps uh, the teams to run experiments on different audience groups. For example, based on location, job title, company, industry, etc. Ramping, it allows them to safely introduce like ramp or deramp or take out the feature uh, from the outside public. And this is uh, independent of the code deployment. So even though this new feature has been deployed and is available on production, through this ramping and deramping, they are able to make it accessible to others or removing it. And obviously the bigger piece is experimentation. It's an advanced experimentation infrastructure platform that handles large scale data. And it has uh, state of the art experimentation features like multivariate testing, advanced randomization features, reporting and alerting, variance reduction techniques, even looking at it from uh, the metric owner, most impactful experiments. And that's this platform plays a critical role as a checks and balances at LinkedIn to ensure member safety and uh, uh, you know our guardrails as well as we are pushing through to uh, advance our growth, making sure that we maintain our guardrails. As you can have seen so far, uh, there is a lot of demand on the LinkedIn experimentation platform. Every team, every individual, every engineer at LinkedIn is touching the T-Rex experimentation platform. And obviously, there's a lot of requests that are coming our way. And for us to be able to prioritize all of these requests, we have developed an objective uh, prioritization framework. Uh, some of the criteria uh, for us, the purpose for that is to quantify business value and uh, are able to compare apple to apple uh, between different requests that are coming from different teams at, on LinkedIn. For example, a, requ a feature request coming from uh, the flagship team who are working on consumer facing uh, features. How can we compare that to a request that's coming from an infra team who is working on some infrastructure capabilities? And how can we compare them apple to apple so that we can prioritize it? And this will make our decision making process data driven and transparent. And it will set clear guidelines on what input we really need so that we are able to prioritize these requests. Uh, the prioritization framework we have built is based on four key pillars. The first one is value. And this measures the impact of this ask and uh, to be to make it flexible enough so that it covers the different uh, use cases of value for LinkedIn. It uh, covers a site up, which is like infrastructure capabilities, whether the site is down, for example, in addition to product revenue, key metrics lift and things like that and user satisfaction. The other pillar is leverage. How many number users are going to be touching this feature in the next uh, 12 months? Urgency, we understand, we want to know how urgent is this request in terms of are you blocked? You are not able to proceed with your work without this feature. You have your inconvenient there is a, or you have a workaround. And lastly, we also consider the cost of implementing this feature in terms of engineering quarter effort. For the value rubric, uh, we have provided uh, different options so that uh, someone who is submitting a request uh, can uh, pick the, the top two most important uh, factors that can uh, justify the impact. For example, a PM from the LinkedIn Marketing Solutions 
كان فور اكزامبل هو وركينج اون ادفرتايزر بادجت سبليت تيستينج فور اكزامبل they can pick revenue and metrics uh, as the two most important uh, justification for their feature request uh, they could say oh this uh, can this feature that we are introducing has more than 30 million dollars of revenue potential so they pick number four and it has an uh, it can also uh, make a metric lift uh, for the important uh, metric lift for uh, LinkedIn marketing solution so they can select uh, that number as well Uh, as opposed to someone who's working on the infrastructure team uh, who would be submitting a request for infrastructure changes uh, that uh, that our T-Rex platform needs to support and they would use uh, GCNs and productivity, engineering productivity as a justification for that. So you can see how different teams now are able to uh, pick from these different uh, value pillars and are able to provide impact justifications that feed in into our uh, backlog prioritization formula. Uh, similarly, for the other uh, rubrics, we have identified the uh, different mappings. For example, for the leverage, uh, we, can, we will understand uh, how many users are the potential users of this new feature, and we can pick the corresponding number. For urgency, we really try to understand whether the users are being blocked, or there is a workaround, or it's a nice to have capability and for cost as well we try to use a t-shirt size uh, rough costing estimation so that we can uh, identify what is the effort involved in terms of implementing this feature so finally we can uh, compute the impact score which is a multiplication of the leverage times value times urgency and we are able to prioritize our backlog from the biggest impact score going down But we do realize that some asks have a small cost and can potentially be quick wins. And for that, we compute the return on investment, which is the impact score divided by the cost. So when we identify high ROI items in our backlog, we are able to override and be able to push the ranking of these items uh, to the higher place on our backlog. And this is an ideal mapping of where we strive to keep a balance between quick wins, which are low level of effort, but uh, low impact, or home runs, which are low, low, low effort, big impact, a big batch, which have big effort, big impact, and the fallbacks, which have big efforts, but medium uh, impact. So that's like a a good uh, balanced approach between them that we always look at the backlog and see how, how that is being reflected. Next, I'm going to talk to you about uh, our workflow and how we have we optimized our workflow over the years. Uh, so the idea behind it is that we, we want to apply a design thinking approach with experimentation in the core of our purpose. So what we have talked so far is that first we wanted through the prioritization framework and the backlog prioritization we are focused on doing the right thing the right the right work the most important high impact work now that we have identified the most important high impact work we need to do it right and that's the idea behind the workflow how can we do that a high impact high important work right so the, it has two main pieces main phases in the workflow Uh, designing with empathy and here we gain insights in what our customers uh, really want and why uh, we build clarity in terms of the before and after experience and OKRs we define our OKRs in this big phase and then the deploy with confidence and this is where we gradually release and ramp through percentage ramping to efficiently address the unforeseen issues that we even did not think of at early on And then we measure the success metrics and our OKR, the object, the key results. And then when we announce, we announce with impact uh, as well. And not only, oh, we have these cool features and people would say, so what? We want to try to more than so what, uh, address the so what question by really trying to focus on the impact that this has made together with testimonials, as well as, you know, engaging with our users to really learn Uh, get that feedback and iterate if necessary. So the phases that we have on our workflow is first learn and in the learning phase we really understand our user stories, uh, identify the core use cases, 
uh, are able to justify and prioritize the requests. Uh, we are able to put together a product requirement document uh, that even uh, clearly define the requirements as well as the OKRs and the metrics and the objectives that we want to achieve. Then we move into the ideation phase and in the ideation phase that's where we do the design thinking approach, we do flow diagrams, flow charts, wireframes, really engage with our user uh, so that we can quickly iterate and uh, uncover unseen uh, requirements that the high level we were not thinking about, uh, identify the non-objectives, non-goals as well, be clear with them. And then after we have identified them, signed off on the PRD, we are able to work on the engineering design work. And this is where we focus on the hi-fi design, high uh, RFC, we put together an RFC request for change. And again, you know, with our engineering teams uh, being involved, any infrastructure teams, dependency teams are all are able to uh, see the uh, see these changes and the design are able to provide their inputs and are able to understand that there is some dependency and some changes that are happening that are required from them, especially in a multi-product, uh, de cross-dependent uh, software clouds uh, infrastructure. It's not only one team that is being involved in this development uh, activity. So it's very important to follow these steps to make sure that uh, all of these things are being uh, uncovered in the design phase. And this will help us to have a better a smooth uh, deployment code development as well as our roadmap and our project timeline uh, is clear. So after we do these design sign-offs, we are able now to start uh, the uh, building and this is where we, uh, again, you know, part of the design, we define the MVP phase and all of those. We are able to work on the code deployment and the code build and we try to focus on uh, modular code design and uh, user unit testing, acceptance testing, all of those are incorporated into that. And now uh, we move into, after the bug bash, we try beyond bug bash to start doing a ramping. We focus on the primary team who's requesting this feature. We ramp it to that uh, particular team so that they can get the chance to use it. And we get the chance to work with them on pilot projects so that we can see the impact and get early feedback identify any early issues that uh, they might have seen and uh, try to quickly incorporate and iterate with them. Uh, and this way also we get the chance to get them to use it and see the impact across the org of that team, collect testimonials, and then when we are able, to, we build the documentation and training. And finally, when we are able to announce and deploy to company, for example, with in, in the case of T-Rex, we are able to announce with the features as well as the impact it made uh, not only to the T-Rex metrics but to our org metrics and to our company metrics as well together with testimonials. And uh, here's an example uh, of a feature request PRD uh, template that we put together and uh, you know we found it very successful uh, here at T-Rex. Uh, it helps uh, everyone to focus on the problem statement, core use cases, uh, put together the prioritization details that we talked about uh, before, as well as focus on the OKRs, uh, clearly defining what are the objectives and the key results we're looking at. And then it will help us to go forward in the ideation phase to focus on the problem area, focus on the before state and after state, allow the teams also to brainstorm together on that. And then uh, all of this will help us to start putting together the milestones, what is pre-MVP, uh, what are the features that are in the MVP phase, as well as the future phases if need to. And uh, finally, we have a sign-off section, which is uh, we found very important to make sure that all the key stakeholders uh, got the chance to review, comment, as well as sign off on the document. Uh, one more note about uh, putting together your product vision and strategy, which are very critical, and you need to be very clear about, about them, because if you're not clear about your vision and strategy and priorities, then you're just, you know, being working without uh, no clear objectives and no clear goals. 
And uh, one great practice we have at LinkedIn is to put together the vision to values uh, statement. And we start with the vision, which is the dream, the future. Uh, this is what inspires us in the product in terms of what uh, the impact it will be, it will be making. So that's, you know, the focus statement on the vision. The mission describes the goals and the purpose of the product, why the product exists today and what's its goals and how this mission is going to eventually get us to that future of the vision. Uh, then we put together the target audience and here we list down our primary user personas. This is the primary users of this product. We really need to be very clear on them and even try to uh, prioritize these uh, prior user personas. Um, and then we also be clear about the non-users, especially if you have a high demand product with high backlog and uh, requests that will really play a critical factor so that you know which products and personas you're focusing your product on. And uh, if you are a platform product, then you might uh, most likely will have producers as well as consumers and uh, they, they, you will have personas that are grouped on them. Uh, for example, um, uh, you know, Airbnb, for example, they will have the hosts, which are the producers, as well as the consumers who are the visitors who, who place them. So for the hosts, for example, you will have admin uh, boards and you will have different capabilities that are focused on the producer's pers persona, as well as you have different experiences that are offered for the consumer persona. So being very clear on those uh, on who are your producers as well as your strategy should be very clear in terms of how you're going to uh, build up your product features and your uh, platform features. And this comes to the strategy as well in terms of listing down your strategic objectives and roadmap initiatives. For example, you might initially focus on your producers, setting up the capabilities so that they can list their offerings and then you can start opening up to your consumers as well in the uh, different uh, persona groups. Uh, and again, this will also fall down into your priorities and then you need to stack rank all your critical initiatives. If, uh, and uh, one thing that will really help you is if you can answer, if we can only do one thing this quarter, what would that be? So really trying to be hyper focused on terms of your priorities on how you're going to achieve these initiatives that's going to build on your strategy to get to your target audience and to get to your mission. And uh, as we are doing this work, we really need to be very clear on our objectives. And the best way to do that is to list them through metrics. Uh, be clear in terms of what are your true north metrics. Obviously, true north metrics are not easy to move in a short period of time, but these are the things that define your key vision and your moving uh, the big big moving uh, metrics that you're trying to lift the signpost metrics on the other hand are the uh, the signpost that you're going to be able to measure uh, in a more uh, granular manner and be able to see am i moving into the direction of my true north metrics and as you are pushing forward on your true north and signpost metrics you want to make sure your guardrail metrics are uh, are kept safe and you need to be very clear on your product what are these guardrail metrics that you want to monitor and you want to keep an eye on that you're not hurting and finally you need to be clear on your values what are these guiding principles that are going to be helping you in making your day-to-day -day decisions whether it's for your member values like keeping our members safe or your prioritization values in terms of how are you going to be prioritizing your work and for example i showed to you today the prioritization framework i hope you found this presentation uh, helpful and insightful uh, i would love to hear from you please reach out and connect with me at linkedin again and uh, let's chat and if you are interested uh, in any of these templates that i have let me know and i'll be happy to share them with you thank you